We're entering into our Advent season as a church, and what Advent means is arrival, and it's the time where we celebrate the arrival of Jesus, and so we're going to have a series of messages. I'm going to speak this morning on peace. Next week, I'm going to talk about joy, the following week, love, and then we're going to talk about, in the end, the light of Jesus, and something that we have in our church, if you haven't picked it up yet, is we're big on practices, right? We, because we believe that habits form what? Hearts. That's right. And so what we have here is we have these Advent candles, and each week we're going to light one. Uh, this is something that I grew up doing in the Presbyterian Church, and I loved it, and something that Callie and I have added in our family. I want to give this to you. Who in here has toddlers? Let's see. Who in here has kids, kids at home still with them? How's dinner time? Peaceful? Easy, right? Are there fits throwing? Are kids throwing food? Are they yelling at each other? All that stuff. Well, in our house, uh, it is chaos, all right? And I read this book called Habits of the Household. Um, and in that book, he gave this practice, and it's amazing. We added it into our house, is that every night when they start dinner, they strike a match, they light a candle, and they all recite together, Christ is light. And then they go through and they talk about their highs and lows from the day. And so this is something that we've added. And it's actually brought a bit of peace and structure to uh, dinner time. And uh, one of the reasons is because kids like fire, all right? And so what we're going to do together as a church family is, as I light the peace candle, I'd like for us all to say together, Christ is light. And the goal and the hope is that every time we see light, that we see candles, something inside of us says Christ is light. Amen. All right, I'm going to do this. So as I light, I'm going to lead us into it, all right? Let's say together. You ready? Christ is light. All right, let's pray. God, we ask that your light would bring us peace. God, we thank you that the scripture declares and confesses that you're the Lord of all. And so, God, we, right now, we just bring our hearts and our lives into alignment with that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, we're actually going to read the scripture. And so if you could stand with me real quick, I'm going to read God's word. Isaiah 9, we're going to read verses 2 and then 6 through 7. It says, people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in the land of deep darkness, a light will shine. For a child is born to us, a son is given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Of his government and its peace, there will be no end. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that it's powerful and it's effective and God, it leads us and guides us and shapes us. It leads us into reality. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. Hey, you can have a seat. Well, welcome to church. Uh, my name is Bronson. I'm new here. Uh, I'm kidding. But I did just take the first month off of preaching that I've ever taken uh, since we launched as a church. And so I'm grateful for our team of communicators. Are you all grateful for the people who brought the word through the month of November? Um, I'm grateful for this team. Uh, they gave me a rest, and it was good for my soul and my mind. Uh, amen? Um, okay, so we live in a world that longs for peace, right? We long for world peace. Uh, that's why, like, every beauty pageant, they say, I'm just really praying for world peace right now, right? Uh, you know, the number one thing I really want is world peace, you know, peace in the Middle East, right? Um, we long for peace of mind. There are an overwhelming number of people suffering from mental and health-related issues. Uh, we long for peace in our relationship. There's conflicts in our marriages. There's strife in our friendships, in our churches, in our families, we long for international peace, right? Nation, nations rage war like what's happened in the Middle East this past quarter. But the very thing we long for, which is peace, we cannot find. Or when we do find it, it doesn't last. It's fleeting. Some of this is logically because there are things that are outside of our control, right? We can't control the economy. We can't control the nations, we can't even control our own families. Amen? 
We can only really control ourselves, but if we're honest, we can't even really control that, right? One of the reasons that we don't have peace in our lives, a lot of times is because of us and because we're in conflict. And here's the thing that hit me as I was thinking through this. If we long for peace, that means conflict exists, right? That's the logical deduction. Like if I want peace, that means that there's some sort of conflict. There's an enemy, there's an aggressor, there's a victim, there's a crime, and there's a problem. So to have peace, To gain peace and to live at peace means that we must address conflict, right? Conflict must be resolved. So here's a question. Are you at peace in your life, in your home, in your heart, in your relationships? Or is there conflict that must be addressed? This is supposed to be the season of peace, right? You know, peace to all and goodwill towards all humans, right? How many of us know that the holidays often just reveal how little peace there is, right? There's relational conflict. There's family fights and feuds and family members who will not come to family gatherings. There's financial conflict. I got to buy a present for who now, right? What? It just starts adding up. How many of you are in a place where your parents have started telling you, listen, there are too many grandkids, so you're getting a pat on the back and a bottle of maple syrup for Christmas, right? (laughs) There's existential conflict. What do I really believe about all this? There's emotional conflict. Is this really all there is to life? Is this really who I'm becoming? There's situational conflict. Maybe you have a hidden vice, and it's hard to look people in the eyes. Maybe you have a string of failures, and when you get together with family, it's like, that's all anyone you feel like is thinking about. Maybe there's a string of lies in your life that are getting harder and harder to keep up with and maintain. Or maybe they've caught up to you, and you now find yourself all alone. If we want peace on earth and goodwill for humans, It must start through the transformation of individual hearts, which means that the conflict in our hearts must be addressed. Here's the issue with our vision of peace. Here's the issue with the, I just want world peace prayer, is it's laboring under the delusion that peace comes through one fell swoop. But the truth and reality about peace is that it doesn't come through one fell swoop but by the one-by-one transformation of human hearts by the God who loves us and who designed us. The advent or arrival of Jesus means peace in this world at war. It's light piercing the darkness, right? It's peace in the midst of chaos. He is the prince of peace, and the peace of his government shall know no end. So here's what I want to talk about this morning. How do we live and walk in the peace of Jesus? Peace that is not fragile, peace that's secure, and peace that lasts. There's different paths to peace. Okay, there's the path from outside in, right? From outside of us, inside of us, which is looking to society. And this peace is unstable. There's peace from inside out, which is looking to myself, right? For peace, and this peace is fragile. And there's peace from upside to inside to outside, which is peace that's found from looking to God, receiving within us, and then extending out into the world. And this peace is unbreakable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this last approach, and we're going to unpack it. And here's what I want to propose to you this morning. If we want peace, we have to first address the conflict that we have with God, then address the conflict we have within ourselves, and then out of that, address the conflict we have with others. Amen? Amen. If you want peace, you have to sort out out your relationships first with God, then yourself, and then with others. Point one, Advent, the arrival of Jesus, offers us peace with, say it with me, God. God. Isaiah 9, 4b Then six and seven, it says this. It says, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, 
For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and the greatness of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Okay, now the book of Isaiah, which we're building uh, most of this series out of, uh, is the book that came, contains the most messianic prophecies, and it's the most quoted book in the New Testament. So it's the most old quoted Old Testament book in the New Testament. It's a book that casts incredible hope but against an incredibly grim backdrop. The book of Isaiah is a prophetic warning to the people of God that if they did not return to God and, and honor their covenant with God and lay down their idolatry and stop oppressing the poor, that judgment would come. Now, if you remember, we studied the book of Jonah uh, back in August and September, and there was a little nation called the Assyrian nation. You all remember the Assyrians? I should have pulled one of these quotes. Maybe I'll do it for next service. You remember how brutal the Assyrians were? I mean, go back and listen to uh, Sermon 1 from that Jonah series. We go through the brutality of these people. So what God is saying to his people is, if you do not honor the covenant that I've given you and walk and live as the people of God, there will be judgment that comes first through the Assyrians. And if you still don't listen, he'll bring through the Babylonians. Now, what was happening? They were worshiping foreign gods. They were hurting and taking advantage of the most vulnerable of the people in their own community. And they were no longer recognizable as God's blessed people who were to be a signpost of his nature and character to the world. And there was necessary judgment because of this. Now listen, we do not like judgment as modern people, right? It's yucky and it's mean, all right? That's how we feel. Now there are some of us who like it too much. For the most of us though, it's tough, right? So much so that in my daughter's daycare, they can't even take away recess, all right? <laughs> so we're like talking to them. This is a whole nother aside. This is just me ranting. But we're talking about some behavioral issues. And I was like, okay, like what are the consequences? Like, well, we can't really do consequences. It's like, well, there's the problem, <laughs> you know? Like, <laughs> good luck. Um, listen, here's what we learned in our series in Jonah. Judgment actually paves the way for mercy. It's not a difficult concept, right? A toddler who is not disciplined will bring chaos and destruction upon their household and everyone in their path, right? And all the parents said? Amen. So out of their love for the child, they bring judgment or punishment down on the child. They host interventions, they give consequences, they take away Mickey Mouse, they do whatever they need to do. And what are they doing? They're bringing down judgment on the child that they love so that the child will listen, become aware of the issues, and change their ways. And if they do, that parent will meet the child with mercy and open arms. What God is saying to the people of Israel through the prophet Isaiah is, I will no longer tolerate your destructive behavior, and there will be judgment. And you see this throughout the Old Testament. Now, here's something interesting. I was reading a commentary on Exodus last month, as one does, right? And it was interesting, Walter Brueggemann made this point, I've never heard this before. He said that God's judgment on the Egyptians was not just simply that God was trying to release the Israelites from Egypt. It was deeper than that. See, if you go and you study the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created, right, the heavens and earth. And it says, if you study in the Hebrew, it actually says that God hovered over the chaos and he brought order. What you see in the nation of Egypt is destruction and disorder. What were they doing? They were sinning against God's creation. And Pharaoh had set himself up as the sovereign Lord of all creation. So Yahweh came in and he said, I will not tolerate this behavior. I will judge your land. I will shame your gods. And I will show that I alone am the Lord of all creation does what the Egyptians did sound at all familiar to us? Instead of having a Pharaoh who occupies the throne of our lives, the throne of our lives is occupied by sovereign king self. And with sovereign king self on the throne, what happens is, is destruction and pain and chaos flows out of our lives. We struggle as modern people with the idea of sin, right? Because one of the tenets of secularism 
is that the highest truth is to be authentic to yourself and to do what is truest to yourself by yourself, right? But the issue with that, if we're honest, is that when we follow our instincts and there's no external authority, what comes about is pain and chaos. And what the scripture says, and this is really kind of what sent this whole message in motion for me, is this actually makes us enemies of God. Look at this in Romans 5. It says, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, God died for the ungodly. Now, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person one might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have been justified by his blood, how much more so will be saved by, from God's wrath through him. Now, look at this. For if while we were God's what? enemies. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. How much more so by being reconciled by him shall we be saved through his life? Now listen, I've read this, I don't know how many times, thousand times. And I always skipped over verse 10. I never really thought critically about it. While we were God's enemies, if we want peace with God, we have to first recognize that there is conflict between us in God. So what beef does God have with me? <laughs> right? It's kind of a wild thought. Like God has conflict with us. Why? The biblical term would be this term sin. Sin that is deforming and bringing about chaos and pain and destruction on you and those around you. J.I. Packer says this in his book, Concise Theology. He says, Scripture diagnoses sin as a universal deformity of human nature found at every point and in every person. Sin brings about pain in others because it is the reality of a life out of order. It's a life in conflict with the creator. So God cannot have a passive attitude towards sin. Why? because sin is destructive. It goes against the design. Listen, you cannot and will not have lasting peace without first dealing with your conflict with God. If we wanna understand and walk in the peace of God, we have to engage with the reality of our need for peace with God, which means we have to come to terms of the fact that there is conflict between us and God. Uh, some of y'all know my story. When I was 16, um, I developed quite a little addiction. Um, <laughs> I got caught up in, you know, the pain pill epidemic that we're still in. Uh, but in the early 2000s, and by 16 years old, I'd spent three years in addiction. Uh, I cracked my teeth and got some pain pills, and I was like, these are pretty nice and spent the next three years hunting and living for that. And um, by God's grace, I hit my rock bottom fairly young and didn't go through what a lot of other addicts go through. Um, also by God's grace, I had a family that took me in. And so my family took me in, my aunt and uncle, y'all have heard my story, got in a little trouble, my mom got scared, sent me to live with my auntie and uncle in Columbus, Ohio, that's right. And, um, up in Ohio, uh, about a year in, I'd gone through some trauma, some other things, and I'd relapsed. And nobody knew about it, but when they, when they did find out about it, I was kind of, you know, lying and telling half the truth and minimizing. And my uncle took me out on the back deck and absolutely filleted me, like <laughs> brought the full force of the judgment that he could down upon me. And he was like, you have no idea what your aunt and I have sacrificed. He said, we haven't gone on a date in a year and a half. He says, we haven't been able to have a drop of alcohol in this house. He said, we've had to live under constant stress and worry that what you have done is what you were doing. And he said, I don't know that I want you in my house anymore. And in that moment, the full weight of what in my mind was just taking a couple of pills, having a good time, hit me. And what I heard somebody else recently refer to as a horror of conscience. 
came upon me. And I realized how devastating my sin was upon his life. And I fell to my knees and I wept. And this was the beginning of the process of me getting clean and me finding freedom. I realized what I had done and I entered into a truly repentant stance. The message of the Bible is that man has rebelled and sinned against God and that sin has deformed the humanity and deformed the creation, that it's bent out of shape and caused a cascading, rippling effect through our world. Look at our world. You can boil everything down to the problem of sin. Every social, relational, environmental problem can come back to it. But listen, we will never know a life of peace until we come to that place of horror of conscience and repentance before God. And here's what happens. When we recognize and repent of our sin, God rushes in. Isaiah 9, verse 4, it says, You've shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders. Here's the gospel. The gospel is that Christ has shattered the yoke. He lived a life without sin, died the death of a sinner, and rose from the dead so that we can be reconciled for God reconciled to God. He is God who came not to bring judgment, but to bear it on himself. He walked among us, not to judge the world, but to be judged for the world, not to condemn us, but to save us. He's the one who filled the righteous void that could never been filled in his life, yet he took on the full weight of God's wrath in his death. He lived a life of complete righteousness, but died under God's judgment so that you and I who've lived a life of sin could know God's mercy. He has ended the war, and he's resolved the conflict. Here's the truth. Uh, there's a guy named Desmond Tutu from Africa, um, and he was involved in um, what happened in South Africa, the, the reconciliation that happened there. Uh, and he makes the point that to be brought to true reconciliation, the reality of the wrongs committed have to be brought into the light, right? Right? And so a Nazi cannot sit with a Jewish person and have peace unless the reality of the concentration camps and the horror of Auschwitz is apologized for, right? Desmond Tutu says this. He says, forgiving and being reconciled to our enemies or our loved ones is not about pretending that things are other than they are. It's not about patting one another on the back or turning a blind eye to the wrong. True reconciliation exposes the awfulness, the abuse, the hurt, and the truth. It could even sometimes make things worse. It's a risky undertaking, but in the end, it's worth, worthwhile. Because in the end, only an honest confrontation with reality can bring about healing. Superfi superficial reconciliation can only bring about superficial healing. Now, Desmond Tutu is talking about relationships between men and men. But my belief is that between men and God, there has to be a full accounting for sin. There has to be a full accounting for who we are and for what we've done. Listen, this is a time where if you do not have peace with God, you can turn to him, recognize and admit what you've done, and accept peace. Amen? Fedor Dostoevsky said this. He said, above all, don't lie to yourself. The man who lies to himself listens to his own lie. And he comes to a point that he cannot distinguish the truth within him or around him. So he loses all respect for himself and for others. And having no respect, he ceases to love. God wants to restore us to a life of love, life, loving him, loving ourselves, and out of that vast well of love, loving our neighbors. So point one, Advent offers us peace with God. Point two, Advent offers peace with self. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, 3 through 5. It says, I care very little if I'm judged by you. I love Paul's swagger in that, right? I care very little if I'm judged by you. <laughs> what a hilarious thing to say to somebody. Uh, or by any human court. Indeed, I don't even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It's the Lord who judges me. Our, our world is all like self-confidence, right? Believe in yourself. Like have a little swagger, right? You're enough, friend. 
You're enough. But here's the reality. Self-confidence is an incredibly fragile confidence that offers an incredibly fragile peace. If you were rich, how do you respond when you enter the room with somebody who's richer? If you're good looking, how do you handle it when you come around somebody else who's better looking than you? If you're used to being the smartest person in the room, how do you respond when someone makes you feel stupid, right? Moments of insecurity pull the curtain back on the true source of our security. Think about it. Think about the last time you felt insecure. What it really did is it revealed to you where you find your peace. Callie likes to make fun of me that uh, middle school were my glory days. She's not wrong, all right? Um, I got my first girlfriend, started to fit in, you know. Uh, I had a little success athletically and socially. I was really blossoming. Um, Preseason camp, Riverside Middle School, all right? I I was dominant, all right? I was dominant on the gridiron, all right? I was running back and moving, whatever. And at the high school game, the middle school, so we had two middle schools that fed into this high school, and the middle school teams came together for this game, and, like, the offensive linemen from my school were like, y'all just wait. We got this new running back, Bronson Duke, gonna run all over you. You better get ready. And so, like, there's kind of this, like, middle school battle happening and all this trash talk. And the guy from Lakeside Middle, they were like... (laughs) They're like barely listening to us. And they're like, bring our guy around. This dude comes around, and I'm telling you, he's an Adonis, all right? He's an 18-year-old and a 14-year-old body. The, the dude is ripped. Not only is he like more athletic than me, he's much better looking than I am, all right? So I'm standing, this guy's like ter- towering over me, and I'm trying to like act tough. I, I, I become very aware that his jersey fits a lot tighter than my jersey fits, all right? And so I try to have confidence, and y'all, they beat us to absolute death, All right. After the second series, they didn't put me back in the game. They're like, this isn't working. We got to put somebody else in. And and I'm crushed. I'm devastated. And my promising career came to an abrupt end. All right. I didn't play another snap the rest of the season. All right. I lost my confidence, my swagger, all that is gone. Why? Because I weighed 120 pounds. All right. It's an it's amazing what a high amount of confidence will do for a person. But I found that confidence in myself is never enough. If it's in me or my looks or my ability or my money, when I encounter someone richer or stronger or better looking, it absolutely devastated me. This is the great lie of secularism, is that you will find peace in yourself by just accepting yourself as you are. But here's the reality. Autonomy from God does not lead to life. Ultimately and eventually, it leads to shame. Relationship with God leads to security despite errors of failure. Remember what what Paul said, I care very little how I'm judged by you. That's coming from a deep well of security. He's not saying I'm exalting myself above you. He's saying your opinion of me compared to God's opinion of me is nothing to me. In fact, God's opinion of me is so strong in the moments when I absolutely hate myself. I can look to God who reigns on high and say he loves me, he gives me value, so therefore I must have value. The advent and the arrival of Jesus gives us peace with ourselves that is secure, it's eternal, it endures, it's real, it stands against all the other things that seek to tell you that you're worthless, that you're unlovable, that you're a failure, and God says you are indeed all those things, but I love you and give you value anyway. When you know who you are in Christ, It brings security, but it actually brings you something even greater. It brings you humility. Security in yourself leads to pride. But a person who's secure in God becomes humble. A person secure in self becomes more prideful, and a person full of pride 
is void of love. So let's get practical. What's your source? What's your thing? Yo, we all have it. We all have stuff. I remember a couple months back, a year ago, I got around a bunch of other pastors who were so much better read than me. <laughs> like, they had read so much more stuff. They were so much smarter. And I had to confront it. I was like, this is not a good place to put my identity. This is not working for me. Y'all, it's continual. So my question for you, is it your intellect? Is it your looks? Is it your money? Is it your athletic ability? I want you to name it. I want to encourage you, name it. Hold that. Whatever that thing is, hold that in your mind. And rest in the fact that God loves you. Something else that we do with Georgia, this came from that book, Habits of the Household, read it, it's great, um, is every night, before we go to bed, at the end of the day, regardless of what has happened, I sit down with Georgia, and I'll do this with the boys when they get a little bigger, and I say, Georgia, can you see my eyes? And she looks around, she's not paying attention. I said, Georgia, how do we listen with our ears and our eyes? Can you see my eyes? She says, yes, Daddy, I see your eyes. I said, do you know Daddy loves you? And she goes, Yes. I said, do you know daddy loves you when you do the wrong thing? She says, yes. I said, you know daddy loves you even when you do the right thing? She says, yes. And then I asked this question, who else loves you like that? God does. Rest in his love. So I want to encourage you. You got to know that you have a heavenly father who loves you when you do the wrong thing. He loves you when you do the right thing. And you can rest in that love and you can be secure. Amen. This, this holiday season, you're going to encounter family members who are greater than you. We were sitting in a life group, and one of the guys was talking. He gave me permission to share this. He was like, I just finished rehab for the second time. And when I go to family gathering, my cousin just bought his first Ferrari. And he was like, I freaking hate it. He's like, if I'm being honest, I hate it. Here's the reality. When you're secure in God, you can become humble enough to encounter someone who's successful, more successful than you, and be happy, with, happy for them and engage with them with an overflow of love. Because here's what I found. A lot of people who are the most successful have found that the greatest stuff in the world, when you have it all long enough, it's great, but it's not that great. And it starts to wear off, and you want something deeper. So Advent offers peace with God, offers peace with self. And then when you have that and you're humble, you can live at peace with others. Point three, Advent offers peace, peace with others. Um, Matthew 6, 14 through 15. If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. Here's a question. Is there anybody in this season that you need to release? Are there family members, friends, who, if you're honest, you just can't stand them? Listen, as Christians, you don't have to like everybody. I'm just telling you. There's some people, you're not going to believe this, there's some people in this church you are not going to like. But through Christ, you can love them. You can release them. You cannot hold their sin against them. I remember a couple of years ago, I just went through some really hard stuff in my life. Um, some stuff at the time I didn't understand. Um, I had some conflict with friends, and um, I had one person in particular who just told a lot of lies about me, if I'm, if I'm transparent. And a number of people had believed those lies, and it caused a lot of issues for me at the time. And um, I remember one night, Actually, it was one morning. I was going through my quiet time, and I was so angry. I was just angry. I was bitter. And I felt really justified in it. Have you ever been there? You're like, this person has hurt me, and they will pay. And they deserve to pay. And I will make them pay. And I, I had this moment, and, and I was studying uh, Luke chapter 4, the mission statement of Jesus. I've come to give recovery of sight to the blind, that the captives will be set free, that the year of the Lord's favor would come. And as I was going through this, it makes you dig into 
the mission of Jesus. This is mission statement, which that, that phrase, the year of the Lord's favor, refers to something called the Jubilee, which the Jubilee in the Old Testament was something within the people of Israel where they were to release debts every 50 years, release all debts. Uh, slaves and prisoners were be to set free and the community was to be reset. And if you study the teachings and the life of Jesus, what Jesus came was to bring release. And here's what hit me. I was holding this person in my debt. And what I've come to believe is that when we hold other people in our debt, we actually oppose the ministry and kingdom of Jesus because the kingdom of Jesus spreads through release and forgiveness. When we have security from God, internally with God, we can release other people and we can allow them not to just be at peace with God, but to have peace with us. Y'all, that's one of the greatest gifts of Jesus. And so here's my question. Is there anyone that you need to allow to have peace with you? Listen, not everyone is gonna come to you and ask for forgiveness. Not everyone is gonna own the wrong things they did to you. It's irrelevant. If you hold on to it, there's parts in your life where the kingdom and the reign and the love of Jesus just can't touch. And so here's what I wanna encourage you to do. Release it, and if you will, there will be this explosion of love and grace and blessing that flows out of your life. And here's my hope, is that at some point, when that person who maybe did unspeakable things to you comes to you for forgiveness, they might be, they, they might be able to know the God who forgives the unspeakable. They might be able to know the God who forgives the unforgivable. And those who were once enemies of God might be called friends of God. Amen. Desmond Tutu has this path of forgiving the unforgivable or seeking reconciliation. I want to give this to you. If you want to write this down, I think we've got a slide here that has these four things. In every layer, you can apply this. Number one, it's admitting the wrong. What have you done? I want to encourage you, you can take a picture of this, you can write this down. This is a great quiet time practice. What have you done? You could use this as a place in your journal to tell the truth and to lift some, list some facts about harm you've caused or, or even harm that's been caused to you. Number two, witness the anguish. Look deeply at how your actions have harmed the other. Write sentences that begin with, I'm sorry for. Write as many sentences as you can. Number three, ask for forgiveness. Write it out and then go to them. And number four, renewing or releasing the relationship. You begin by asking the person what you can do to make it right. And here you can list your own ideas about how you can renew the relationship. Here's the reality. I don't know if I set this up well going into this slide. There are a lot of people that you need to release and allow it to have peace with you. But here's what I know. We all have places where we need to ask for forgiveness and seek peace with others. Amen. If we want peace on earth and goodwill for all humans, it starts through the transformation of individual hearts. Peace comes not through one fell swoop, but through the day by day, one by one, transformation of humans. Amen. So here's my last thing. Invite Jesus and receive peace this year. Amen. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you for everybody that's under the sound of my voice. God, we thank you that you're the God who brings peace. You're the God of hope, the God of love. And I just want to lead you guys right now just through a time of reflection and prayer. Firstly, if you don't have peace with God, as we were talking about it earlier, and I'm going through that section on having peace with God, maybe something leapt in your heart where you're like, I don't have that. I'm not able to recognize the wrongs that I've done. 
I just want to give you a moment to respond. God, if there's anybody in here who's seeking you, I pray that you give them awareness of the destructive path that their own sin has brought. Whether through violence emotionally or relationally. And if that's you, I just want to encourage you to bring that to God and say, God, I recognize that I've not lived a life of peace, but that you came to bring me peace and I receive it. Next, if you've been going through life with all these stores of security in your intellect or your finances or relationships or your looks, that thing I asked you to hold in your mind, right now I just want you to offer that up to God. Say, God, I recognize that this area will never bring me the peace that I seek. Lord, help me find peace in you. And lastly, peace with others. If you need to seek forgiveness or give it, allow that situation to come to your mind and into your heart and just begin to wrestle with God. Listen, you might be able to release it right now. You might need to go back for prayer to have some other people pray with you, to walk through it, to journal, to write. But I just want to encourage you to begin that process. Bring that person's name to your head and say, God, either help me forgive them or God, help them forgive me. In Jesus' name, all God's people said,